Welcome to another edition of Basta TV here from the Basta 2014 in Darmstadt. With me is Scott Hanselman. He's a program manager in Windows Azure with Microsoft. And um, yeah, he was giving a keynote here. And now I have the chance to talk to him a little bit about the ways the industry goes at the moment. And there are many ways the in industry goes at the moment. Um, and there are many opportunities. And um, one thing is that now happens that things which seem to be settled for years, for ages maybe, are changing now. And there are now people who might ask, what should I start with? Which language should I use? Which kind of system should I concentrate on? What advice would you give such a person? Well, even though I work for Microsoft now, mm. you know, I've been there five years, I've been in the industry for over 20. Mm. So I, I always have a long viewpoint. Uh, I'm thinking always 15 years, 20 years down the, down the way. So I always say, bet on the web. Mm -hmm. you know, so if the web goes a certain way, so goes everyone else. Uh, even with app stores and mobile devices and Windows 8 and Chromebooks, the web is what's underneath all of those things. The web empowers those things. So if you were going to learn a new technology today, I would make sure that I started with you know, presuming you have computer science knowledge, uh, web technologies. So JavaScript, JavaScript, JavaScript. If you know JavaScript, you can write web applications on the, on the proper internet inside of a browser. You can write a Windows JavaScript application, like all the Bing applications and all the apps that we see. They're native apps. They're JavaScript. If you want to write something for Firefox OS, that's JavaScript. If you want to write apps in Chrome, that's JavaScript. So number one, JavaScript. And then the second thing I would say would be learn a systems language, some language that's being used in the enterprise, like C Sharp or Java or something that lets you build large scale systems. And I think with, with C Sharp and JavaScript um, you know, under your belt, you, you have uh, the power to build pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, uh, pretty much anything is a good point. Uh, when you know for whom you are building it, there's mm -hmm. just a at the moment, uh, also a discussion running uh, which says we have to do everything for the consumer. Uh, and other people say, no, we have to do it for the enterprise. And now you're making up both. You say learn a system language mm -hmm. for the enterprise. Right. And learn a web language, JavaScript, um, to do all the parts which are visible, maybe. Right. Yeah. Um, but what kind of mindset is demanded from uh, such a developer who is able to do both? What do you think? Well, in the, in the old days, we would talk about how I'm a middle tier developer, or I'm a data developer, mm. or I'm a front end developer. And while I think there's a group of people that call themselves front end developers and do HTML and JavaScript, more and more I see the words full stack on resumes, full mm. stack developer. And I always want to see what's one layer below what I'm looking at. Mm. So if someone teaches me a technology, I want to learn that, but I also want to lift up the, the lid and see what's underneath. So um, I think it's important to be a full stack developer, to be flexible enough to understand these things. Now you say that JavaScript would be the front end and the systems language would be the back end, but we're also seeing things like Node in the enterprise mm. and C Sharp on iPhones and Windows phones and Androids. So one could argue that while JavaScript is a front end language and C Sharp might be a back end, it is possible these things might continue to, to flip-flop. Mm -hmm. So I like C Sharp myself because I actually uh, have, a, I'm going to give a presentation in a couple of weeks at another conference where I have an app that has a cloud component, an iPhone component, and a Windows component. And they all talk to each other mm -hmm. using web standards. And I wrote the whole thing in C Sharp. Mm -hmm. So in that case, there was no JavaScript involved. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing native Windows and native iPhone and a scalable cloud service. And I wrote it in one language. So I, it, you know, it could be argued I could have done the same thing in JavaScript as well. That's why I think that those two languages are just so flexible mm -hmm. that uh, it lets you be a full stack developer. Yeah, uh, full stack developer that also means that you're not, um, say in the old days there was some ideas of there's the Windows world, there's the Java world, uh, there's the open source world, there's the closed source world. But to be a full stack developer today means yeah, to change between these words and use the, the means that you need mm -hmm. 
uh, to reach your ends. Mm -hmm. As you described it, you decided to be a C Sharp developer because you like C Sharp and you like JavaScript. When you don't need JavaScript, you don't use it. Right. Um, does that mean that any developer has now to be fluent in any language? Or is it a new way of working together, maybe? Because when you feel that your project reaches a point where you need Java and you right. don't you know how to write Java, what will you do then? Well, so then that gets into the idea of being a polyglot programmer. Mm. But the thing is, with when one decides to specialize, you have to start ignoring other things. We're going to have mm. a talk later where we talk about yeah. ignoring the right, the right number of things. We need to accept that as programmers, we can't know it all. Mm. So you have to decide how, how much of a generalist are you going to be and how much of a specialist are you going to be. And I like to just say, I want to know one layer farther down than the next person. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm never going to be an assembler, assembly language, low-end microprocessor type person. That's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. But I will know one layer below my specialty and one layer above. Mm -hmm. So I, I encourage people to stretch a little bit deeper than they're used to. But you do have to accept that you can't know it all. So mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know Java. But I do know that Java is a curly brace language. I wrote it 15 years ago mm -hmm. when I worked at Nike. I know that Java and C Sharp are all part of the family of you know, static compiled uh, JITED language, languages. So while I may not be able to write excellent idiomatic Java today, I know that I could get up on it within six months. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel um, crippled by that fact that I'm not an expert Java programmer. Mm -hmm. Moreover, I understand how to build large systems. Yeah. And I think that's, some, uh, that's a talent. Being a systems architect is language agnostic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point because large systems, that's what, what, what appearing today suddenly uh, out of nothing mm -hmm. sometimes. And uh, that means dealing with a quite, quite big complexity too. Yeah, you, have, you have system architectures uh, which are yeah, um, mixed together out of uh, different, many different components. Um, and they have to, to function and, and, and um, to serve one end. Um, and there's a new kind of complexity appearing suddenly. Like, not only the languages are the problem, the question is which backend do I use, which client will I have, is this only the browser, do I need native apps maybe? Um, how difficult is it uh, to, to cope with this complexity and are there strategy to cope with it? Yeah, I think it's extremely difficult and I would even go so far as to say that it gets even more complicated when you remember why we're writing this software for the business. Mm. Unless you're an academic or you're a hobbyist, fundamentally 90% of software is being written to support some business. Mm. So there's regulatory complexities, and tax complexities, mm -hmm. multilingual complexities. Uh, ultimately, it just comes down to layering. You have to, you have to be able to hide some of these things. You work on a problem and then you abstract it away. Um, but this is where working in teams is so important. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, there's a number of developers that have made a lot of money with apps in the App Store that they wrote by themselves. That's one kind of software development where you're all alone or you have a team of one or two and you write a piece of software and it's great. But a different challenge is working on a team of 40 or 50 or 500 mm. and managing that large system complexity and dealing with multiple cultures and multiple languages, both spoken language and programming languages mm. and things like that. Um, those are people skills mm -hmm. at that point. That's less about technology and almost entirely about organizational dynamics. Yeah. That's where the real complexity happens. Yeah. That's a good point, these organizational dynamics, because they are changing at the moment a little bit. Um, there's a kind of transformation going on in the IT industry because of small companies, um, which are startups maybe in, in one way. They set up yeah, a group of people, 20, 30 people, and then doing something great, changing the world, or being bought for. $90 billion, <laughs> like what, uh, WhatsApp maybe. Um, and they are doing something different suddenly. Mm -hmm. And um, now there's on the other side, there are the enterprises, as you said. We're doing software because it's about business. Mm -hmm. yeah, and someone wants to earn money with it. Uh, not only by luck, <laughs> like WhatsApp, but also planned. And uh, now there's these big enterprise doing things for ages now. And now I'm the developer in this enterprise and say, I want to do something different. I heard about the cloud. It seems to be interesting. I want to do something with it. Um, but this has an influence then on the organization because 
maybe my organization doesn't allow me to do to work with it and I have the interest to do it because I see there's an advantage for my organization when I do it uh, and that may have a transformational impact on the organization too how would you suggest should someone start something like that maybe we call it a startup in the enterprise and mm -hmm. say hey boss I want to do something what's the way to do that well, every enterprise is different. Some are more stifling mm -hmm. and kind of hold people down more than, than others. Um, but when new ideas are to be expressed in a non-threatening way, it, you know, this is, you, when you're a junior engineer, you don't want to threaten yeah. the boss and their, techno their technology. I have found that um, setting up communities of like-minded people within an enterprise is a good start. Uh, bosses rarely have a problem with you making a brown bag lunch mm. to talk about a new technology. So if you worked at a new at a company and you wanted to introduce uh, Xamarin tools, let's say that you're a C sharp shop, you do your stuff in native Objective C, and you want to introduce C sharp, you could write a report about it, you could talk to your boss about it. But another idea would be to have a brown bag, a community get together where we all have our lunch and we watch a presentation on it, and you kind of slowly introduce this idea, and, and this is my opinion, to the point where the boss thinks it was their idea. Yeah. You know, I was giving a, the work, uh, architecture workshop, the pre-con workshops, and a lot of the times this question of these soft skills come up. Architects and software engineers rarely forget, rarely remember rather, how important it is that you manage perceptions and you, you are a good team member and you're kind and you're thoughtful and you remember that everyone has a different goal. Your boss wants to look good to his boss mm -hmm. and, and to her boss and to the president. So uh, when you're trying to introduce something new into a company, you have to think about, um, as an engineer, you're saying, well, this is the right thing to do. It's correctly, it's technically correct. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we're in the business of doing, technically correct things. Mm -hmm. We're in the business of selling widgets. Yeah. So you have to figure out how to introduce your new idea in a way that supports the business, mm. in this case, selling widgets. Is this going to lower costs? Is it going to increase throughput? All these kinds of things. Mm. You can't just go and push an idea on its technical merit mm. and expect your boss to say, thank goodness you introduced us to this new technology. Yeah, um, well, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that, that, that makes a, yeah, especially it sounds, you can't say to your boss, there's the cloud and it's vast and uh, yeah. there's a lot of power. But the, the, interesting is, is, uh, the interesting thing is, what can I do with the cloud? Exactly. Yeah. So you as a developer have to know on both sides, mm -hmm. yeah, the technical part and the business part maybe. Well, I don't think you, just, do you, you think don't have to be an MBA, but mm -hmm. you have to understand that we are here to support a business. Mm -hmm. I mean, the business might be widgets or might be healthcare, who knows. But if you try to push the technical correctness of something, you inevitably will lose when you get up to the business people. Mm. You have to give them what they want. Mm. What they want is efficiencies and happy employees and correct solutions. Mm. So when you think about, let's do the cloud, boss. Have you thought about or do you understand what the regulatory issues are for your country mm. and your industry and those kind of things? You have to do your homework a little bit. Yeah, doing your homework with the cloud. I wouldn't want to talk about the cloud. Yeah, uh, I think it, most people don't yet understand what the power of the cloud really is. Not the technical power, but the, the, the impact on the industry and on the work of the people. What should a uh, developer look at uh, within the cloud? We don't talk only about Azure. We, we're really yeah, talking yeah, about the in cloud general. in sure. general. What should he, as a developer or she, look at mm -hmm. for him or herself and then in the end for his business? What do right, you think? Well, so what's important to realize about the cloud maybe? The, the, the cloud is, is hosting as a concept, mm -hmm. you know, having a web host that, you know, we have $5 web hosts and everyone has, a, has had a host in the past. It's hosting generalized and made elastic. Mm -hmm. It's hosting with an API wrapped around it such that rather than me logging into a, uh, a web portal and making a new website like I've done for the last 20 years on a web host, but now being able to programmatically spin up a web farm of 20 machines and use them for testing mm -hmm. and then delete them without having to call support. Yeah. You know, so it's choice, it's elasticity, it's an API 
it's flexible billing, but it's also regulations. Mm. Um, if I'm an insurance company, I'm sure that there are certain regulatory issues about where customer data is kept. There are, there's guidance in all the clouds, whether it be Amazon or Rackspace or Azure, about where and how customer data should be treated. There's patterns on how you can still use the cloud while keeping your data inside of your firewall. There's VPN options. Being aware of those things as opposed to just saying, oh, well, the cloud means taking, losing control of my business. Mm. The cloud is about gaining control of your business. Mm. It's about, uh, it's an enabling technology. It's mm. not a loss of control, I think. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, you yeah, sum up lots of uh, technical parts of the cloud, mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, it seems that uh, one important feature is what we are talking about here really is not technic or technology, it's the excellence of the individual using it. Yeah. How do you gain that? I mean, yeah. that, well, <laughs> you're working in your office, and you start working, you go home yeah, and things, yeah. and, and why should I change something actually? Well, that's funny, that's practice, 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 right? Mm. Uh, well, there's the old joke about, I want to play piano at Carnegie Hall, can you tell me the directions? <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Um, I did an interview with Douglas Crockford, uh, the mm -hmm. discoverer of JSON and a JavaScript luminary, and I asked him what the secret was to writing better software. And he's, he's a kind of a wise old gentleman, and he said, well, write fewer bugs. <laughs> okay. I was like, well, are you, really? He said, yes, we are not a disciplined group of people. He says, we need to have more discipline. Mm -hmm. We need to have the kind of discipline that made the space shuttle mm -hmm. work. Uh, he's talking about continuous integration and deployment and delivery. He's talking about testing and test driven development. He's talking about thinking about the correctness mm. of, an, of an, an, an idea before just slapping the keyboard again. Mm. Um, if you want to be good at something, you need to practice. Mm. You need to exercise. Uh, I think that there's a, a kind of developer that just goes to work and they go stamp, 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 stamp. Mm. Chunk, chunk. They work on their assembly line of software and then they drag themselves home and then they do it again. I think that's sad. We need to look for the excitement and the interest and the power of, of the transformational power of software. And uh, sometimes that means doing work on the side. Sometimes it's a startup inside your uh, company. Sometimes it's working with a Raspberry Pi in your basement. Mm. Uh, but I think if you can't be excited about software, maybe you should find another job. Wow. Uh, that's a good final word. I mean, don't you think? Yeah, you're right. Not to be mean. Yeah, not no, you. no, 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 not no. Not you personally. <laughs> <laughs> you understand. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, stay excited and, and try new things. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, good advice. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. My pleasure.